Adam that raised his voice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They said how? He said, in the day of Ashura, when Imam Hussein was a child, was mostly related to the life of أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Chapter 10 of the Holy Quran or Surah Yunus Jonah contains 109 verses which were revealed in the holy city of Mecca prior to the migration of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam from the holy city of Mecca to the holy city of Medina and when we come to the 10th chapter from the holy Quran entitled Yunus or Jonah we find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins a new phenomenon. A gesture in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins to entitle chapters from the Holy Quran after prophets, probable prophets, are infallible individuals. For example, the 10th chapter is entitled Yunus, Jonah. The 11th chapter is then named after the Prophet Hud, Salawatullahi alayhi. And the 12th chapter is dedicated to Prophet Yusuf. And the 14th chapter is entitled Ibrahim, or Abraham, the 19th chapter carries the name of Maryam or the Virgin Mary, the 31st chapter takes its name after Luqman, the 47th chapter is dedicated to Rasulullah Muhammad. And the 71st chapter takes its title from Nuh or Noah. But why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen to begin this phenomenon of dedicating chapters from the Holy Quran To infallible individuals. Obviously, the very first reason is to give solidarity to Rasulullah and the Muslim community. In what sense? In a sense that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, just like they fought you. Just like the number of believers in you is minimum, just like you're facing a lot of hardship and difficulty, just like some of the members of your family and your tribe are disbelievers, other prophets, other infallibles, other great individuals also face the same difficulty. And remember, this is in the holy city of Mecca. Where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam's companions were prosecuted. Where they faced a lot of challenges. In Mecca, the pagan Arabs created a, created a torture house for the companions of Rasulullah. Where they would take them to the torture house and they would torture them to the point where some of them lost their lives. The parents of Ammar, Yasser and Sumayyah, they were tortured until they lost their lives. And Rasulullah, every single day he would go and he would watch them being tortured and he would raise his voice, Sabran, Ya Ala Yasir, Sabran Ya Ala Yasir, Fa Inna Mawidakumul Jannah. Endure patience. 
remain strong for your place of rest is Jannah. So Allah gives solidarity to Rasulullah because all those events obviously bring pain and agony to him. And similarly, it gives solidarity to the Muslim community as well. A community that's being driven out of its home, a community that's being fought with, a community that has gone under sanctions because the pagan Arabs, they decided that they're going to annihilate all the Muslims. And what happened? Abu Talib took all the Muslims into a camp that he owned. And the Muslim community lived in that camp under the protection of Abu Talib while they suffered from sanctions in Shaab Abu Talib. And Abu Talib was the one that spent on them. Abu Talib was the one that protected them. Abu Talib was the one that ensured their food. Abu Talib was the one that ensured their security. So it's a form of solidarity to the Muslim community that the people of Nuh also saw difficulty. The people of Lut, the people of Hud, the people of Saleh, the people of Musa, the people... Nations prior to you also saw difficulty, but this is the legacy that remains from them. So you should aim to have the same legacy, a legacy of endeavor, steadfastness, bravery. Another reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the phenomenon of naming chapters after those individuals It's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to seek lessons from their lives. How is it that they dealt with their community? How is it that a leader was successful in his community? What caused the community to be successful and what caused the community to fail? Allah tells us the history of the tyrants. The history of those who stood against innocent human beings just because of their belief in God. And third, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to simply honor them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants their name to remain alive. And that's indeed... What happens when some of the believing men and women, some of the mu'mineen and mu'minat, they go towards the visitation of the holy shrines. The shrine of Rasulullah, the shrine of Amir al-Mu'mineen in Najaf, the shrine of Al-Imam al Hussein in Karbala, where millions of millions of people will walk towards the shrine of Imam Hussein in the event of the Arba'een, the 40th, commemorating the 40th of Imam al Hussein. While some other Muslim schools of thought, scholars, sects, become extremely upset that this could be shirk, this could be ghulu, others would tell you this is a form of wasting time. You can give salam to Aba Abdullah al Hussein from here. Why the need to go there? The first purpose that we visit the shrine of Al-Imam al Hussein is to seek solidarity from the story of Al-Imam al Hussein, And when we remember the magnitude of the tragedy of Imam al Hussein, what happens? Then all the tragedies become easy to comprehend and fathom. If I've lost a child and I compare myself to Imam al Hussein, I say, May Allah bless your heart, Ya Aba Abdullah. You didn't just lose one child. Maybe I lost my child in a car accident or through an illness, but how did he lose his children? When I think of being away from my family, I think of the family of Imam al Hussein. And all the tragedies then become easy to comprehend, to fathom, to deal with. When I 
think of the fact that I have unconditionally 100% loved and served my community, yet they stand against me, or they, you're not, they are not united with me, or they do not appreciate me. And I look at the story of Imam al-Husayn, and it brings ease to my heart. It brings solidarity to me. Another reason is I seek lessons from the story of Imam al-Husayn. For every moment of the life of Imam al-Husayn was a lesson. And this isn't just in the day of Ashura. When Imam Hussein was a child, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam pointed to this fact. Al-Hasan wal Hussein imaman qama wa inqa'ada. They are imam. They ought to be followed. Husaynun minni wa ana min Hussein. Hussein is from me and I am from Hussein. My legacy will be protected by Hussein. And third, we honor Al-Imam Al-Husayn. And that's indeed what the Quran wants from us in Surah Al-Shura. Aus and Khazraj, those two tribes, they came to Rasulullah in Medina. Ya Rasulullah, we used to fight one another, we used to kill one another over pity little things. We never married from one another, we never gave loans to one another. We lived a horrible life. We used to worship idols. We used to bury our daughters alive. You came and you changed our future. You came and you opened our eyes. You civilized us. You turned us into human beings. How can we repay you, Ya Rasulullah? What does the ayah say? قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى Ya Rasulullah, tell them they cannot repay you with money. They cannot repay you by buying you mansions and giving you gold and silver. But the way for them to repay you is only one way. Only one way. For them to love and show their love for your Ahlul Bayt. Al-Mawaddah is different from Mahabba. Mawaddah is when we show our love. When we demonstrate our love. And that is why people gather to visit the shrine of Imam al Hussein. Now an interesting question arises here. We know that Allah dedicates eight chapters after those infallible individuals. Whether it's Luqman, whether it's Maryam, whether it's Nuh, whether it's Muhammad. Whether it's Yusuf, but why is it that Allah begins this phenomenon of dedicating chapters to those individuals with the story of Yunus, Jonah, Yunus bin Matta? Indeed, we will realize that this chapter contains the most perfect introduction for this phenomenon, for the Muslim community can completely understand and accept the situations introduced in the 10th chapter and incorporate that within their lives. Before we examine the story of Yunus, let us take a look at some of the key verses within this chapter after your loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The 92nd ayah of the 10th chapter says, فَالْيَوْمْ نُنَجِّيكَ بِبَدَنِكْ لِتَكُونَنَّ لِمَنْ خَلْفَكَ آيَةً The ayah speaks to Pharaoh, Pharaoh. And it says to Pharaoh that today we will save your body so that you can be an ayah to those who come after you. So Pharaoh, he was ayatullah. Because Allah says, 
He is an ayah. But what kind of ayah and for whom? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the qualities of Fir'aun was one. Al-Zulm, injustice and tyranny. And two, Tughyan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will make you an ayah for every zalim, every tyrant, and every person that believes their power is so unlimited that nothing can change their fate. Some people say, can you tell us or give us proof that Qur'an stands against, for example, ISIS? I say, yeah, of course. Even though ISIS didn't exist in the time of the Qur'an. But Allah, for example, uses the story of Fir'aun. يُذَبِّحُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ وَيَسْتَحْيُونَ نِسَاءَهُمْ He would kill their Children, the story says that he ended up killing 1,000 newborn male children so that he would make sure that he kills this enemy, this person that's going to bring the collapse of his empire. But yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Musa. And he would turn their women into slaves. Even when his own wife, she believed in him. And she says, I have to go public with this information that I reject you as a God. He says to her, I don't care. You can go and worship the Lord of Harun, the Lord of Musa. I don't care. But just don't tell the people. Because once people will say the wife of Pharaoh, this goddess who was also worshipped, says Pharaoh is not God. How am I going to convince people outside my home? She said, no. She stood and she firmly stated that I believe in the Lord of Musa. And I believe in the Lord of Harun. And the magicians also, after they saw the miracle of Musa, they believed in Musa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu mathalan. Allah uses the example of Asya bint Muzahim. The wife of Fir'aun. ضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا For all the believers. امْرَأَةَ Fir'aun, The wife of Fir'aun. She had everything. She had money. She had slaves. She had popularity. They used to worship her. امْرَأَةَ Fir'aun, إِذْ قَالَتْ رَبِّ ابْنِ لِي عَنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ Oh Allah, I seek refuge to you from Fir'aun and his people and what he claims to be. They say Fir'aun took her and they cut her body open with a knife. All her body. And he threw her in a bucket of salt. Imagine what type of torture. Until this woman died. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this example to tell every spouse, every wife, and every husband, look, you're meant to be the one that brings your spouse towards iman, towards taqwa, towards piety and righteousness. If you're asked why you don't wear the hijab or the veil, my husband, he doesn't like it. Your husband doesn't like it? Brother, why don't you go to Hajj? Because my wife, she doesn't want me to go. She says it's too soon. If you come to Hajj, life is going to be boring. So I'm going to wait five, six years from now. Allah says, be the wife that motivates your husband to pay his charity, to sponsor orphans, to go to Hajj, to take the children to the Islamic school. Be the husband that motivates his wife to observe the hijab, his children to pray. 
Be the father that teaches his children honesty. Teaches his children how to live as noble, free human beings. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we will save you. So that you can be a sign for all those who are doing dhulm. Those who think that their fate is never going to come. And I tell you, today we have many Muslim nations, many Muslim governments that are at the peak of being the pharaohs of their time. And Allah makes this promise that I have saved Pharaoh and I have put his story in the Quran so that he would be a lesson for all those tyrants. Several days ago, there is people in a Majlis of Aza commemoration in Yemen and the F-16s of the Saudi monarchs come and bombard them and they kill them. Not once, but several times. And they're still finding their bodies. The people of Yemen who are in need of medicine, who are in need of schools, who are in need of education, the impoverished nation, instead of helping them, they are your neighbors. You bombard them and you destroy them and you destroy their homes and their bridges and their schools and their hospitals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have left Fir'aun to be an ayah for those ulama, zalimeen, and their day will come. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them time. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never forgets the zalim. The 105th ayah from the Holy Quran of chapter 10. وَأَنْ أَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا and stand your face firmly to the faith. Stand firmly your face towards faith means you have to stand firmly. You have to be strong. You cannot be weak in the matters of your faith. And that, brothers and sisters, requires one thing and that is knowledge in the matters of faith if i have inherited my faith with emotions or from my parents or from my ancestors and it's all based on emotions i can never adapt the 105th ayah from surah yunus waqim wajhaka lid-din hanifa to stand firm. Because once I am asked of matters of my faith, I only not have answers, but it weakens my faith. It brings doubt to me. Of course, this verse can most relate to the life of the youngsters, the youth, my dear friends. This is the time when you educate yourself about your religion, about your faith. And don't base your ideology upon emotions. Yes, emotions are good. Crying for Imam Hussein is good. The aza of Imam Hussein is good. But emotions are meant to attract us so that we can open our minds and learn and read and educate ourselves. And that's how we can stand firm. A young man by the name of Mus'ab ibn Umair. You know the story of Mus'ab ibn Umair. At the age 15, he would go with Rasulullah, he would go with his father to business trips. In one of the business trips, he saw Rasulullah. Rasulullah had stood and he was giving a sermon and Mus'ab was attracted to what Rasulullah had to say. Extremely attracted to him. 
So he kept telling his father, once you go back to Medina, I want to come with you on the business trips. So every time his father went to Medina, he would go, he would leave his father and go and sit in front of Rasulullah. See what this man has to say. Until Allah overtook his heart, the heart of Mus'ab ibn Umair, by the love of Iman, by the love of Rasulullah. He told his father, Oh father, I want to go and live with Muhammad and I want to become a Muslim. His father was the wealthiest man in the Arabian Peninsula. And he was the biggest landlord of the time. He owned a lot of properties. And he only had one son, Mus'ab. He says to him, son, you decide. Me, my money, my wealth, the inheritance, or Muhammad. This young man didn't need to think or hesitate. He says, I will never choose anything above Rasulullah, about, above the religion of Islam. Yes, there were emotions involved. So they say his father even stripped him from his clothes. He came to Rasulullah. He became one of his companions. But which kind of companion? The type of companion who then became the ambassador of Rasulullah. Teaching the people the ahkam. Teaching the people the religion of Islam. Teaching the people halal and haram. Teaching the people the holy Quran. Similarly, Al-Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad ibn al-Sadiq, yes, some of his companions at a young age, such as Hisham ibn al-Hakam, maybe they came to him because of emotions, maybe because of love. But to them, they turn into scholars. And this should be the key role that the majalis of Al-Imam al Hussein must play within the lives of the youth. فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا The hundred and seventh ayah from the tenth chapter. وَإِنْ يَمْسَسْكَ اللَّهُ بِضُرٍ فَلَا كَاشِفَ لَهُ إِلَّا هُوَ وَإِنْ يُرِدْكَ بِخَيْرٍ فَلَا رَادَّ لِفَضْلِهِ يا رسول الله No. That if you're inflicted by pain, the only one that can remove that pain from you is Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَمَّنْ يُجِيبُ الْمُضْطَرِ إِذَا دَعَاهُ وَيَكْشِفُ السُّوءُ He is Allah. Whether it's an illness, whether it's poverty, whether it's a special need, whether it's problems within the home, whatever it is that you're inflicted with pain, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can solve that. And then he says, وَإِنْ يُرِدْكَ بِخَيْرٍ فَلَا رَادَّ لِفَضْلِهِ And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to send his blessings and his khair to you, no one can stop that. No one can take that away from you. Meaning, number one, have your hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And trust your affairs with Him. Know that He knows the best for me and you. Submit to Him. وَجْعَلْنِي لِقِسْمِكَ رَاضِيًا قَانِعًا وَفِي جَمِيعَ الْأَحْوَالِ are you looking for a treasure? Are you looking to be happy with this treasure for the rest of your life? It is to be content. Don't look for gold. Don't look for money. Because we love cars, but when we drive that car for one year, it becomes old. We love vacations, but you go to vacation to Switzerland and France and Luxembourg, and then what happens? Three, four days, you get bored. You want to leave. You want to go somewhere else. There is one thing 
that will serve as that treasure in your life, that will give you the satisfaction, and that is to be content. And one cannot be content without the remembrance of the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For Allah says, أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبِ And number two, Allah says, don't ask other human beings. Why? Because they are as weak as you are. If they're inflicted with pain, they need Allah. If they have any blessing, it comes from Allah. So you and them are in the same boat. In regards to your need to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya ayyuhal nas, antumu al-fuqara'u ila Allah. All of you, every single one of you, every one of my creation is faqir, is in need, is in a state of poverty. To whom? To Allah. From the multi-billionaire to the person who's picking up garbage with a minimum wage, they are all impoverished because they are all in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why I recall a hadith that says, angels, they don't have emotions. I mean, they don't laugh, they don't cry. But there is two areas where angels smile. They laugh. One is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to bring someone down, wants to destroy Saddam Hussein, wants to destroy Muammar al-Qadhafi and the other tyrants and inshallah the Saudi monarchs very soon when Allah wants to bring them down and they try and the media tries and the people try and the money and the armed forces to take them up the angels they laugh so what are you doing? you're wasting your time and also when the opposite happens, when Allah wants to take someone up and the entire world wants to try to bring him down. Allahu Akbar. How many people, how many governments, how many caliphs, how many kings, how many princes, how many presidents, how many prime ministers, they tried and they failed when they wanted people to forget the name of Hussein. The angels, they laugh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to take Hussein up. He wants Hussein to shine. And you want to take him down? Never. وَإِنْ يَمْسَسْكَ اللَّهُ بِضُرٍ فَلَا كَاشِفَ لَهُ إِلَّا هُ وَإِنْ يُرِدْكَ بِخَيْرٍ فَلَا رَادَّ لِفَضْلِهِ The 109th ayah. وَاتَّبِعْ مَا يُوحَى إِلَيْكِ وَاصْبِرْ حَتَّى يَحْكُمَ اللَّهُ وَهُوَ خَيْرُ الْحَاكِمِينَ Ya Rasulullah, you have an imam, you have a leader. You must follow this leadership. You must follow its footsteps. You are ma'mum and he is and it is the imam. He is the qa'id and you are the muqtada. You must follow. What is it? Ya ayyuhal rasul. Ya attabi' ma yuha ilayk. What is the imam? The wahi. Follow the wahi, the instructions. Why follow the wahi? Because the wahi is directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Follow the Quran. Keep the Quran as your imam. Because number one, the Quran never lies. The Quran never lies. Number two, the Qur'an will always give you the best advice. For those who try to seek advice from here and there, maybe sometimes we should even ask 
we should also ask the advice and seek the admonishment of the Quran. And number three, Amir al Mu'mineen says, Ma jalasahu ahad illa qama bi ziyadatin wa nuqsan. Every person who spends time with the Quran will rise with an increase and a decrease. نقصان في عمى وزيادة في هدى. A decrease in blindness, a decrease in confusion, a decrease in ignorance, and an increase in enlightenment, increase in knowledge, Incle increase in certainty. اتبع ما يوحى إليك. Wasbir and have patience, Ya Rasulullah. Patience to what? Patience to obey Allah. Sometimes the obedience of Allah is difficult. It's not something easy. In what sense? One day a person came from Khurasan to Imam Ja'far al Sadiq. He says to him, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, do you not see Bani al Abbas and what they're doing? You don't see how tyrant they are? Ibn Rasulullah, rise. Speak. Do something. So Imam al-Sadiq says to one of his servants, turn on the tannur, the oven. Big ovens, they would bake bread. So he went and he turned on the tannur. Imam al-Sadiq says to the Khurasani, go and sit in it. Says, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, I told you I love you, but what is this? Tell me to go and sit in the oven? I told you, yes, let's rise. But I didn't expect you to send me into the oven. So Imam Sadiq says, no, it's, you don't want to go sit down, it's okay. You don't have to go. Moments later, Al-Mufaddal ibn Umair came. Before he walked in, before he sat... Al-Imam al-Sadiq says to him, Ya Mufaddal, ijlis fit tannur. Ya Mufaddal, go and sit in the oven. He didn't, Ya Ibn Rasul, why me? I'm Mufaddal. He went and he sat inside the oven. You can imagine now what happens to this Khurasani. Imam al-Sadiq then says to him, so how long you're staying here? What's your plan? How are our Shia and Khurasan? How are... Until he says to him, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, you know, I, I cannot think. How could you just send that man into the oven? Imam al-Sadiq then raised his voice, Ya Mufaddal, ukhraj. Mufaddal, come out of the oven. He came, the Ruwaya says, Yanfudu an thiyaba, cleaning his shirt. He came and he sat down in front of Imam al-Sadiq. Imam al-Sadiq then looked at the Khurasani, the man, and he says to him, how many people do you have like al-Mufaddal in Khurasan so I can rise? He says, zero, Ya Ibn Rasulullah. Sometimes the ta'a, the obedience is hard. Sometimes we need to challenge ourselves in this obedience. So Allah says, wasbir. And sometimes in the face of the disobediences, we have to have patience. I sometimes can easily disobey, easily accumulate sin. It's not difficult. And there I need sabr and patience. Amir al Mu'mineen, Al Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says to his people, he says, Don't think that Muawiyah is tougher than me. No. Muawiyah is not tougher than me. I can also pick up the sword and the sawt and I can discipline you. وَلَكِنْ هَيْهَاتْ لَا أُغَيِّرُ نَفْسِي But no, I would never step over my principles, my belief, and this needed sabr. For a leader to have so much patience, so much mercy, so much compassion, one day he was giving his ata from Bayt al-Mal. A man came and he stood to him, taking from Bayt al-Mal. 
He says, I never fought with you, I never will fight with you. Meaning I will not be on your side. I never pray Salat al-Jum'ah with you, never did, never will. I never loved you, never did, never will. Give me from Bayt al-Mal. Imam Ali gave him from Bayt al-Mal. Then he looked at him and he says, In lam yasil adhaka ila al-Muslimin, lam yasil adhaya ilayk. If you're not going to trouble any of the Muslim community, if you're not going to be a troublemaker, then I'm not gonna, you're not going to see and witness any trouble from me. Yeah, you don't want, you don't love me, you don't want to pray with me, you don't want to go to jihad, and that's fine. It needs patience. It needs sabr for someone not to step over those principles and say, you know what? This person has the audacity, I'm the Khalifa, he's talking to me like this, send him to prison. واتبع ما يوحى إليك واصبر. Have patience حتى يحكم الله until Allah His حكم and His governance and His reign arrives. Meaning when? Meaning the آخرة. يا رسول الله there is an آخرة and there is a time where the ظالم or those who take that which does not belong to them. Those who destroy homes. Those who spread rumors. Those who fill their lives with accusing others. Their day will also come. It's the day where Allah will reign. It's the day where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will establish His governance. That day also exists, Ya Rasulullah. Now, when we understand several of the key important verses within the 10th chapter, Surah Yunus from the Holy Quran, we can realize why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose this chapter to be the introduction to the phenomenon of naming other chapters in the Holy Quran after those infallible individuals. It is because this chapter carries such endless, fruitful lessons. Lessons of morality, lessons of steadfastness, lessons for all human beings alive. However, Allah chooses to entitle the chapter with the name of Yunus or Jonah because his story is one of the most beautiful one of the most inspirational stories from the Holy Quran. Let's examine the story of the Prophet Yunus within the tenth chapter. Within the tenth chapter, after your loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. الثانية غفر الله لكم. الثالثة على حب الإمامين الحسن والحسين بأعلى أصواتكم. The story of Jonah is not only a story that is within the Quran. But it is a story that unites the people of the book. As in the story of Jonah is also a story that's mentioned in the Holy Bible. And the grave site or the tomb of Jonah or Yunus bin Metta and Mosul was a sanctuary for the Muslim community, the Jewish community, and the Christian community, and a tomb that was visited by members of all those three faiths. However, in July 2014, ISIS, when they entered Mosul, 
they destroyed the tomb of the Prophet Yunus salawatullahi alayhi. Yunus, it appears that he lived in the time of the Prophet Musa and Harun, around the same time. And he was a prophet to Iraq, close to the area where he was buried, probably, Nainawa or Musul. They say for 40 years he preached and he preached, but only two people believed in him. One of them, he was a carpenter, and a normal guy, and one of them was a scholar, and he was a wise man. You know the story, I'm not going to take so much details telling you the story of the Prophet Yunus. Yunus says to Allah, Ya Allah, those people, 40 years, they don't want to believe in me. They're hard-headed. I want you to bring your punishment to them. Punish them. So Allah says, okay. Tell them that soon, three days will come, and within those three days, some traditions say the color of the sky will change, and some say the color of their own faces and skin will change. As an introduction to that massive punishment coming from God to them. So Yunus, O Jonah, he went to his people and he told them, Listen, soon God's going to send the punishment. You still don't want to believe? said, you sound like you're going crazy. What, the sky is going to change colors? For what reason? Are we going to change skin color? For what reason? So he said, okay. Jonah then left with the carpenter. The scholar said, I haven't sinned. I haven't done anything wrong. I'm going to stay and remain in the city. So he remained. Jonah he left the city, adios amigos, and he, they say, sat in a ship. The Quran and the Bible together, they speak of the incident in which they took Jonah and they threw him in the ocean and he was swallowed by a gigantic fish. Is this scientifically Something that we can accept, is it not? I leave it for you to go and read. There are whales today, according to studies done by scholars of the Bible and the Quran, that can swallow a man that's six feet tall. They can swallow. So scientifically, it's not my field of expertise to tell you how that works. Allah says it's a miracle. Just like he says that he changed the fire of Abraham onto him. Just like, for example, this, the, the ocean split for Moses. I mean, is that going to scientifically be? No. Anyhow, this is what Allah says in the Quran. That he got swallowed by the fish. Now, when he got swallowed by the fish, what was happening to his people? Yes. Either the sky was changing color, their face was changing, their skin was changing color. And they realize that yes, there is a punishment. And the punishment is imminent and it's coming. And it's exactly what Jonah had told us. So they went to his house, he wasn't there. They went to the store of the carpenter, no one was there. Then they went to the house of the wise man. They said to him, listen, we truly want to repent. We truly want to seek forgiveness from God. We want you to help us. Is there a way for us to be helped? He said, if Jonah isn't here, if Eunice isn't here, Allah is always here. So let us try to go to Allah. They said how? He said we go to Him like He will witness us and receive us in the day of judgment. This is how, we'd, this is how we go to Allah. They said how? He explains to them, يَوْمَ تَرَوْنَهَا تَذْهَلُوا كُلُّ مُرْضِعَةٍ 
أما أرضعت وتضع كل ذات حمل حملها وترى الناس سكارا وما هم بسكارا ولكن عذاب الله شديد A day in which you find people it's as if they're intoxicated They're afraid They don't know what's going on A mother forgets about her newborn baby On that day no one's drunk No one's intoxicated It is the fear that has taken over them He says to them we go to Allah in this manner In a state of fear Separate every mother from her newborn Separate every male from females Separate every child from his parents Let everyone understand that the punishment and the wrath of God is coming Then let us hit the desert Let us tell Allah that we understand there is no one else to help us To change our situation besides you Then we pray to Allah Maybe we will have his mercy on to us And this is exactly what happened They went and they prayed And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them salvation Allah within the 98th verse From the 10th chapter says فَلَوْلَا كَانَتْ قَرْيَةٌ آمَنَتْ فَنَفَعَهَا إِيمَانُهَا إِلَّا قَوْمَ يُونُسْ لَمَّا آمَنُوا كَشَفْنَا عَنْهُمْ عَذَابَ الْخِزْيِ He says every nation, their iman <coughs> refrains them from the punishment, from being exposed, from being humiliated. But the nation of Yunus, they, they reached the borderline. The adab had gone to them. But they believed and they repented truly. And then Allah switched the course of their life. And He blessed them. What does this tell me and you? That if we want to repent, things have to change. My lifestyle has to change. The way I do things needs to change. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always the compassionate, the merciful, the all-forgiving. So Allah removed the punishment from them. Here is Yunus and the stomach of the fish. The noon is whom? Yunus. The noon is whom? فَظَنَّ أَنْ لَنْ نَقْدِرَ عَلَيْهِ فَنَادَى فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتْ سُبْحَانَكَ إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ When Yunus was in the darkness of the night, the darkness of the stomach of the fish, and the darkness of the ocean, the depth of the sea, فَظَنَّ أَنْ لَنْ نَقْدِرَ عَلَيْهِ He, dis he thought that there is no hope, that this is it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to change his situation. But yet he said, Subhanak, inni kuntu min al -dhalimeen. Oh Allah, I was amongst those who did zulm. Zulm to whom? To himself. Meaning what? Meaning, Ya Allah, maybe I should have stayed. Maybe I should have had more patience. Maybe I should have given a better chance to my community. Subhanaka inni kuntu min al-zalimeen. Fastajabna lah. As soon as you realize you've done something wrong, and you go to Allah, and you say, Oh Allah, I realize that what I did was wrong, and I repent from it, and I want change. Allah says, this is it. This is tawbah. فَاسْتَجَبْنَا لَهُ وَنَجَّيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْغَمِّ Then Yunus, he's thrown out from the stomach of the fish and he then returns to go to his family, to go to his people and he sees that everyone in the community now, Salamu alayka ya Nabi Allah, they respect him, things have changed. So he asks them, 
What, the punishment didn't come? He said, no. How? They said, we repented. We went to Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed the evil from us. And he accepted our dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within Surah Al-Qalam says speaking to the Prophet Muhammad Fasbir Ya Rasulullah Fasbir Have patience Fasbir li hukmi rabbik وَلَا تَكُنْ كَصَاحِبِ الْحُوتِ إِذْ نَادَى وَهْوَ مَكْضُومِ And do not be, Ya Rasulullah, have patience, and do not be like Jonah, when he ended up in that situation where he was regretful that he asked for a punishment for his people. Meaning what? Meaning the job of a leader is to remain patient with his community. To be the leader of forgiveness. To face difficulties. To have a big heart. To accept them. To pray for them. To want guidance for them. And that's how you find some people, some leaders in history, they've reached enormous victories. A leader like Mahatma Gandhi, who stuck with his people, who saw so much difficulty, but yet he was patient. And God gave him victory. A leader like Martin Luther King Jr., who led the civil rights movement, who changed the situation of the African Americans in the United States. And today, if the White House embraces a black president, he is indebted to Martin Luther King. Why? Because that man was patient. That man stuck with his community. That man saw the difficulties, he changed the course of history for his people. And there is no other man that endured so much patience and had so much sabr but yet so much compassion so much love they saw him on the 10th of Muharram as he came out of his tent and he looked at the ocean of those who came to fight him and stand against him والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله